Hello and welcome to A View from 22, where The Spectator takes another look and perhaps a deeper look at something in the news. I'm Kate Andrews, The Spectator's Economics Editor, and I'm joined by Freddie Gray, our Deputy Editor. Hi, Freddie. Great to be with you, Kate. Uh, now, this is a fascinating development over the weekend. We have unlocked the Twitter files. Elon Musk has been promising that he was eventually going to reveal what happened back in 2020 when Twitter took down a major political story about Hunter Biden's laptop leading up to the election between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Um, before we dive into what's been revealed, can you take our audience back to 2020 leading up to the election, when the New York Post drops the Hunter Biden laptop story. What is it? What are the revelations in the story? And why did Twitter ban it? Well, I do think it's worth going back because a lot of it's sort of lost in the, the fog of the pandemic. Uh, and it feels like a lot further back in time than it actually was. Um, so the, the story yeah. essentially is that uh, uh, supposedly, though some people question this story, uh, a computer repair shop owner called John Paul Mack Isaac, which I was like, that's, that's his name. His last name is Mac. His Mac Isaac, yeah. Uh, he's a real person. And maybe he has a computer business? He has a computer shop in Delaware. And Hunter Biden left this laptop and he found it and discovered all these sort of shocking things on it, including lots of pornography involving Hunter Biden, but also lots of emails detailing Hunter Biden's peculiar and I would say nefarious business dealings with China and Ukraine. Now, what seems to have happened after that is that the FBI... Uh, went around, tell, well, he, um, John Paul MacIsaac actually took it to the FBI and so nothing ever happened. It seems like they just sat on it. But at some point, the FBI uh, started warning big tech companies that there was a big misinformation leak, big fake news leak, similar to what might have happened in 2016, uh, which would be a foreign entity interfering in the election by dropping damaging news about one of the presidential candidates. Um whether they actually specified this was about Hunter Biden, we're not entirely sure. The New York Post has a very interesting front page story about it, suggesting that they did. Um, so they sent out this warning to companies. And then so when the New York Post broke this uh, huge story, really, a very, very interesting story at a very important moment in the election cycle about not just as people are sneering on the weekend, it's not just about photos of Hunter Biden's penis. No one really cares about that be beyond an allurid sense. A lot sense. of people don't want to see that. A lot of people do, even weird, more weirdly. But it's a mixed not, bag out there. But that's, <laughs> but that's not the sort of political the important right. point of the story, is that there is this, the, the New York Post's uh, original big scoop was that there is this email about a deal that Hunter Biden was involved in, involving the Chinese, where there is this email that writes off 10% for the big guy. We don't know that the big guy is Joe Biden, but it could be. And that's a very, very intriguing development at a crucial stage in the election. But because of these warnings, it seems, from the FBI, uh, about, Twitter, hacking. about hacking, Twitter labelled it as hacked material mm -hmm. and shut the story down. And they shut the story down so much that they treated it like they used the same means of sort of shutting it down as they do for child pornography. So you can't share it via direct message. You couldn't. The link was sort of completely nuked, really. And so much so that even the White House spokeswoman at the time, Kayleigh McEnany, McEnany uh, her account was shut down because she tweeted about the story. So it was a, again it, in the days leading up to a in the days leading election. up to the yeah. presidential. Um, and now, of course, we have a new owner of Twitter, and he's been promising for weeks, Elon Musk, to, in his usual sort of trouble-causing way, to, to to do this big reveal. And this was the first. This at the weekend we have the first reveal. There's meant to be more coming about what actually happened at Twitter. And right before we get into the start of the Twitter files, if we stay in 2020 for just a minute longer, uh, and you know, no one really wants to live in 2020 for too long, tough year, pandemic, all of it. But it was grim. we're gonna be there for just one more minute, Fred. Um, at the time, the journalists at the New York Post were flipping out saying, you know, this is a suppression of free speech. This is crucial information. This is public information leading up to a, a, a presidential election. Uh, and, and Twitter did not budge. Twitter did not budge. Uh, and what is clear from these, I'm going to get into the files a little bit here, I'm afraid. What is clear from the uh, exchanges that Matt Taibbi, this uh, American journalist who Musk seems to be using to release this on Twitter, what's clear is that the Senior executives at Twitter knew that what they were doing was not really sustained. It wasn't really ethical or moral or right. And yet they just sort of went ahead with it anyway, because they'd agreed to this hacked material 
stuff. They were obviously very worried. I think Mark Zuckerberg has hinted with Facebook that or Meta that uh, they were very worried about um, a repeat of 2016 where the wrong side might win and they would be blamed. What for they having, view as the wrong side. What they view as the yeah. wrong side, exactly. Um, but as Elon Musk has said, it was as if Twitter was acting as an executive arm of the Democratic National Committee. So let's dive right into the full material. Um, interestingly, Elon Musk has decided to start revealing the Twitter files through a journalist, Matt Taibbi, through a Twitter thread, which yes. is very meta and not the other social media platform in that case. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're starting to get some serious glimpses. I mean, it's a release of emails, uh, you know, so exactly what these people were thinking and writing down at the time uh, about what was going through their head. And there's some fascinating revelations. Um, the first I want to get into, well, there's actually, let's talk about the broad theme. There's a nervousness amongst mm. those executives. As you point out, you can tell that they're sitting there thinking, what if we're blamed for doing the wrong thing? Yes. And I guess that also shows the extent, more broadly speaking, to which you know the insistence that social media platforms get these things just right and ban the right things and allow the right things. I mean, that really comes to a head in the Hunter Biden story. Well, it's. I mean, it's really about uh, arse covering, if I can use that word. Can I, I think so. Word? Yep. It's past midday. Okay, it's Why not? really about arse covering because they are they're wor they're not so much worried about whether it's morally wrong to politically censor a story. They're worried uh, about how it's going to look and how can they really justify when they're faced hard questions, possibly congressional hard questions, further on. Well, there's a line in there about how Jack, the yeah. owner at the time, uh, would be facing questions about this in one of a, in one of the hearings that he already has scheduled coming up. So essentially, they had to get the call right based on what he might be asked by politicians. Yes, I think that's an interesting element of that story. Actually, is Tybee is very clear, keen to say that he's seen nothing suggesting Jack Dorsey had anything to do with it. Yeah. But that might also be the fact that Musk and Jack Dorsey, I think, are pretty pretty pally, pretty close, as far as I know. Uh, so perhaps they want to make sure that he's insulated from these revelations. I think one of the biggest revelations out of the, the start of, of a, what presumably we're going to get in the Twitter files um, is an email dated Saturday, October 24th, 2020. So at this point, you know, we are days away from the election um, in which there's a series of links from Twitter users and it reads more to review from the Biden team. Mm. It seems as though there was a direct link between the Biden team and is also acknowledged to a lesser extent the Trump team mm. in which they were sending Twitter officials tweets that they wanted reviewed and, you know, let's call a spade a spade, probably taken down. Well, they were. I mean, the reply to it was handled these. Uh, so they were just dealt with. Uh, I think perhaps uh, the sort of Team Trump people who are getting very excited about that exchange may have over read into it a little bit over the weekend because those links uh I think, I haven't checked them all myself because you can't, but they all uh, link to uh, pornographic images of Hunter Biden. So that was shutting down the porn, which, you know, you could say... Not in the public interest. Tim Biden, uh, you know, Team Biden had a, had a private interest in shutting that down, which Twitter acknowledged. Um, but then the bigger thing is, of course, this New York Post story, which was very aggressively suppressed. And um, I think it's also interesting that issues of free speech are flagged to uh, Twitter officials. So there's actually a Democratic rep out in California who sends quite a, a lengthy little essay uh, mm. about the importance of free speech and the importance of getting this balance right, um, and also the difference between someone who hacks and then a journalist not involved in the hacking reporting that story, and why he thought Twitter was on the wrong side of this divide. I mean, even Biden supporters were getting in touch. Mm. Just, I mean, I, I'm not suggesting there were loads. We, we only have one clear example here. But it isn't as if the issues of the First Amendment and free speech weren't being flagged to Twitter. Well, precisely. And indeed, an internal report was or external report was uh, commissioned and seems to have made it clear that it didn't really think or it thought the First Amendment isn't absolute was the conclusion of it, which I think within the organisation, clearly a lot of people were thinking, hang on, we do have to think about the First Amendment. Uh, and so that I think they sort of they, they discussed it a bit. They found this report that made them feel a little bit better about the fact that they were covering it all up. Do you think some people were expecting a bigger cover-up to be revealed? I mean, I was reading through it and I was quite shocked by what I was reading. But then on the other side, I was like, you know, these people seem nervous. They seem afraid of making the wrong decision. You really get a sense of doubling down on a bad decision that's coming through. You know, we just, we can't U-turn. Uh, you know, we, we can't look like we got the decision wrong in the first place. 
you don't get these emails that are like, you know, in order to make Biden win, we must cover it up. There's none of that. It's all just kind of chaos. It's Well, I agree. There's nothing actually that shocking. And right. almost in a way, that's, for me, the disturbing part is we all sort of know that this happened, but we've all sort of accepted that it happened. Um, and the whataboutery part of it is, is where I think... Th- this story is interesting, uh, even though I know people dismiss what about you. But, you know, it's worth going through. What about if this was Donald Trump Jr.'s laptop? Right. I mean, there would no, in a mil- there would be no such uh, attempt to cover things up. Uh, no one would have cared about pictures of Donald Trump Jr.'s penis. Mm. I mean, that, Well, again, they might have not liked that, but there wouldn't have been this they, attempt they to cover the, it up. There wouldn't yeah. have been the sort of... the. the very easy engagement between the Biden administ- or Biden team. We shouldn't say administration because they were not an administration. But there wouldn't have been that just sort of assumption that this is helping the wrong side. Uh, and so I think that's that's where the real scandals creeps in. But you're right. There, has, there hasn't been actually anything that shocking. I think the angle that the New York Post is pursuing today is more interesting. And that's to do with what were the FBI doing um, in the run up to this? And, you know, were they using... Uh, sort of fear about what happened in 2016, which has pretty much mostly been debunked anyway, um, to silence a story that that people within the American government did not want to come out because it would have helped Donald Trump win re-election. You know, it, uh, there's lots of sneery pieces this weekend. There's one by Tim Miller in the the Bulwark uh, saying, you know. This is just MAGA people wanting to look at disgusting images of Joe Biden, and that's about all it amounts to. I think that's wrong. I think there is a serious story here, and it has important uh, implications for free speech and things like that. I don't think it's just right-wing nutters getting upset. Well, it has big implications for the relationship between government and these massive social media companies as well. I mean, here in the UK, there's there's the pursuit of the online safety bill, which has a lot of problems for free speech within that, even the watered down version. Um, In the US, you know, there's always talk about making moves on the social media companies. And it always seems to further embed government decision making into the top level decision making of Twitter and Meta and the rest of it. And I wonder if if the Twitter files will actually be evidence that, you know, this can be what happens when you have government people interacting with the social media people. Mm. It always moves towards censorship. It always does. And it's this difficult question of safety. You know, that's it is hard. In, in the UK, the online Times bill that it is and the reason that is good cover for political censorship is because it is good cover. You know, there does need to be concerns about safety, particularly in relation to children, terrorism, uh, pornography and foreign interference in elections. Although I think that has actually been proven to be a bit of a flub for just trying to cover up stuff that you don't want to come out. I think a lot of people on the MAGA right over the years now have argued that the Hunter Biden laptop story could have been akin to the Hillary Clinton server story of 2016 when she hosted that private server in her house to deal with very confidential, very official emails from government. Um, And the claim was, well, gosh, if Twitter had allowed the story to come out, the results of the election would have been different. I am not convinced. I've never been convinced that these stories are the same. I'm not convinced that the laptop story in 2020 would have moved the dial significantly for Trump. The What we've seen from the Twitter file so far, and it is limited, apparently there is more to come, as you say, hasn't convinced me to change my mind either. But what what do you make of the response to the file so far? Is it vindicating those who thought, well, gosh, you know, we needed the story to win? Or is this really not even about Trump in 2020 anymore? It's really a bigger question about where social media companies go from here when it comes to uh, free speech, especially around politics. Well, I think the reaction to it is interesting in that for, uh, you know, MAGA people, this was it. You know, finally, we, you know, we've got our smoking gun. Uh, and then for people who don't like MAGA people, who were like, well, nothing's there. Nothing's there. This is yeah. not that surprising. This isn't what we thought probably happened. Um, obviously, the truth is somewhere in between the two, I think. Um and I think in terms of sort of whether it would have moved the dial, you can't really say. Um, and in fact, I think there, are, there might be quite good evidence to suggest that the suppression of the story was so weird that it, it did mobilise quite a it lot helped Trump. of Trump voters yeah. because it was so obvious that big tech was sort of stacking the, the deck against Trump um, that it drove out the vote even more. Yeah. And indeed, I think perhaps created that climate of paranoia and conspiracy theorizing that led to January 6th because 
uh, you know, Donald Trump's team never justified the stolen election narrative. But at the same time, they, they were right to say there are powerful forces that are desperate to stop us winning. Uh, and that created this climate of uh, paranoia and anger and rage that culminated in, in what you saw on, on January 6th. The difficulty is that censorship is always going to lead to more suspicion. It doesn't then go on to justify violent actions of other people using that as an example. Um, but you know, it, it is very uncomfortable, this idea that leading up to an election in the States, any social media company would take, you know, a big news story printed by the New York Post. You know, the New York Post is on the right. You may not like the New York Post. You may not read the New York Post. This is mainstream media. You know, this is not some blog by an anonymous blogger who's, you know, sharing some emails. It, it's credible. Um, and the idea of, of blocking a credible mainstream source from your social media platform, as you say, it's going to make people paranoid. And, and, I mean, it boils down to, I think, and this is why I think the Post are right to pursue the, the FBI angle, it boils down to the old private companies can make these decisions. You know, Twitter as a private company could suppress uh, information if it wanted to. It had the right, has the right to do that. Elon Musk, as now the owner of it, has the right to release it. Uh, but the interesting angle, or the explosive or dangerous angle, I think, is uh, to what extent were the FBI intimidating... Uh, big tech companies about uh, b warning them that they might be to blame for some great political calamity. And we have no evidence of that so far. What are you expecting from well, the... We do have a bit of evidence. I mean, we? Zuckerberg uh, has said that he was told by the FBI to be on the lookout for... Right, right. Uh, so, Fred, we've had this first drop of the Twitter files, and we may well get more. Do you think that the headlines are being reserved for a drop later on, the really big news, or do you think Elon Musk will have wanted to put the information at the top? Well, I think what uh, Taibbi and Musk are saying, and they're right to, is that it is odd that legacy publications or corporate media are not, take, are not that interested in this story. It, that could be, as some of them will say, because actually it hasn't revealed that much. But I think if this were a story of a similar nature about a different politician, uh, they might be a lot more interested in it. So I think that uh, the Twitter files will, will bubble on and there'll be a story that will be talked about on Twitter in this very meta to confuse it even more with different social media platforms <laughs> in this meta way, uh, it'll become a way that Twitter sustains interest in itself. Um, so I think it's a very, very odd dynamic to have uh, a social media company sort of challenging its past self on social media while the rest of the media kind of looks on. Well, if there's another drop, I'm sure we'll be back here to discuss it. Fred, thanks for joining me. And thanks for watching The View from 22.